Hello class, now we're on the very last chapter and this is uh, what is happening nowadays and what has happened basically since the 1960s. So an American drama in the 60s was a pretty vibrant time, uh, just like kind of in the 20s in Europe, a lot of, you know, new forms, people, people struggling to find different ways to express themselves, lots of experimental theater. Um, you also had the regional theater now growing and becoming a major force in America. Uh, you could uh, have really high quality theater and a lot of times it was a place that you originated works that then went on to Broadway. As Broadway became more expensive, um, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, even in this, you know, uh, you had uh, Broadway shows going out of town. You know, they went to, you know, Boston and, you know, that kind of region, region of the Northeast to try their shows out. Well, even that became expensive. So the subscription audiences from uh, regional theaters were a good place to try a show out because you had a built-in audience and you could take it there and work on it that way. Um, you also had the growth of off-Broadway, which was uh, smaller than Broadway. That's basically any place that's less than 200 seats. And off-off, uh, which is under 100 seats. So you had the growth of these smaller theaters in uh, New York, particularly, and uh, that's where it was really the center of the theatrical universe in America. In the 60s, you had experimental theaters. Look at this, uh, you know, people don't have any clothes on in the show here. Uh, you know, all kinds of things that were uh, uh, taking and pushing the audience's boundary. Uh, also, musical theater hair at that time, too. We, to that earlier on musical. Um, you have, you know, nice mainstream comedy. Uh, we talked about uh, Moliere is one of the great comedia, uh, comedic writers in the Renaissance. Well, Neil Simon would arguably be considered one of the great American uh, playwrights, uh, particularly of the mid 19, uh, mid to, uh, you know, 20th century, the 1900s. Um, he wrote about middle class people. They were funny. Uh, his he had comedy of character, and lots of one liners, good situations. So uh, his first big success, The Odd Couple, was done as a Broadway play. It was done. There was a female version of it later on. It was a TV show. It was a, done as a film. Uh, Neil Simon at one point had about five shows running simultaneously on Broadway. He was that popular, very successful uh, playwright. Edward Albee uh, was another playwright that came out of the, the 60s. Realistic playwright, uh, you know, the realistic American tradition, but dabbled in the absurd elements of it uh, in his plays. He wasn't really completely concerned with realism. At some points he had other his later plays. For instance, his later play, Three Women, had three women, which was the same woman, but just three different time periods. So, but Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf is probably his signature uh, piece about this uh, American couple, childless couple, uh, bitter, uh, divisive, quarreling, but incisive, you know, and really powerful uh, human struggle with uh, trying to make sense of their life, you know, but it's a wonderful, strong play about this very dynamic and interesting and broken couple. August Wilson, uh, arguably the greatest uh, African-American playwright uh, that America has produced, uh, wrote a 10-play cycle uh, covering the African-American experience from each decade of the 20th century. And unfortunately, he passed away uh, before he was all the way done with his 10th play, but there was enough of it done that it, had been, it has been uh, reworked. And uh, again, like any good po poetic playwright has an ear for the rhythms of everyday speech and the realities of their experience. Um, Here's a, here's a little clip from um, Fences, uh, one of his early famous plays. Uh, this is a Broadway performance uh, with uh, Denzel Washington. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see, here we go. Who 
food and they don't say I got to like you. What more is there to say I got to like you? I want to stand up in my face and ask a damn fool ass question like that. Talk about liking somebody. Come here what I'm talking Straighten up, goddammit. I ask you a question. What law is there to say I got to like you? None. Well, all right then. Don't you eat every day? Answer me when I talk to you. Don't you eat every day? Yeah. Nigga, as long as you in my house, you put a sir on the end of it when you talk to me. Yes, sir. You eat every day. Yes, sir. You got a roof over your head. Yes, sir. You got clothes on your back. Yes, sir. Why do you think that is? Because of you. Hell, I know it's because of me, but why do you think that is? Because you like me. I go out of here every morning, bust my butt, putting up with them crackers every day. Because I like you. You got the biggest fool I ever saw. It's my job. It's my responsibility. You understand that? A man is supposed to take care of his family. You're living. Okay. Do what you so you see where it's going with that. Let's just go this way. The values of being a middle class American person. You know, take care of your uh, kids, you know, and uh, again, realistic. Uh, and there's some expressionistic undertones in some of his uh, plays, uh, harkening back to, you know, these forces, the primitive forces, maybe that, uh, you know, that, that maybe are part of us all, but a wonderful playwright and uh, again, very strong American playwright. Then we get into uh, the performance art, which is. Again, going back to uh, reaction against typical theater. Let's do theater that's mostly visual, uh, you know, sensory, not so literate. Uh, you, so we're using art dance. Uh, you're using working with the space. And there can also be solo pieces too. Uh, one of the best, uh, most commercial aspects of this really is the Cirque du Soleil, which is a, ostensibly a circus, but they're really a performing art you know it's circus as a performance art which is something very much more theatrical and uh, mystical and they've successfully uh turned it into a very commercial enterprise tickets for Cirque du Soleil are very expensive a hundred dollar range let's play a real quick clip of Cirque du Soleil to get an idea of what, what it looks like mm -hmm. There's this body traveling on this sort of uh, dragon's head in this kind of you know, sort of this is sort of like the Phantom of the Opera, this kind of mystical world of this person. And nobody really talks much. It's all this kind of language that's just sort of you know sung in this kind of uh, you know indistinguishable tone. You know these images coming down, these beautiful images. Just very visual. At the same time, vaguely, is there some kind of a story? So you've got these wonderful images and music and this whole experience. Um, you're not really sure what it means, but you, you know, the audience draws their conclusions. They draw their, uh, you know, they make the story up. They see and they, they make up their own. That's the great thing about uh, this kind of theater. Um, you allows the interpreter to come into it, to be part of it. Then postmodernism. What happens after modernism? What happens after realism? Well, you just kind of, you really can't go anywhere because basically you're what is. So, uh, so then you start mixing things up. You start mixing up realism and abstraction and craziness and just a big potpourri. Um, deconstructing texts 
here's a screen here's a shot of a version of hamlet with this disembodied person doesn't even looks like half a person sitting on a chair there's again there's a chair on the wall that must be ophelia down there we've got this bank of monitors and music and recordings and sing playing and there's a, a partial text of hamlet um, you know, again, interspersed with other, uh, you know, like Macbeth is thrown into, you know, different parts of Shakespeare's lines. Um, basically, you're blurring this line between high art and popular art. Um, and it certainly doesn't look like it's something that would be for everyone. Uh, but uh, that's kind of where theater could go. So basically, what do we have theater today? So you know, really we've looked at the whole progression of theater. We looked at all the elements of theater. We have looked at how theater has changed and evolved over the years, but how elements have always stay the same, the performer, the space, you know, the movement, the story. Um, and theater basically is the founding, uh, you know, sibling of the, of the brother and sister of uh, television and film. Uh, you know, usually you, you start, uh, someone starts doing theater as, as a youth and then maybe gets into commercial uh, entertainment that way. And also locally, uh, you know, the community theaters in each uh, town, uh, you know, you have your banker and your lawyer, you know, coming and playing on stage. And so people come and see it and enjoy that. They see them in a different role. And since theater is not necessarily a uh, the most expensive or elaborate, you can take a lot of risks. You can do a lot of different things. So you can change things up. And so people come out of theater with these ideas to experiment and try new forms. And it becomes a training ground for performers uh, that go on to the big commercial uh, entertainment venues. So that's a wrap up of theater in the world and hope that you learn to, a little bit more and learn to appreciate the art of theater in our world. So thank you very much. And we'll see you later.